Hey, Bunny, let's talk about books. You see, people always say, hey, Steve, why are you so funny all of the time? To which I say, I don't know. (laughs) People also say, hey, write what you know. And what I know is that I have been a hardworking and loyal from a certain point of view view employee at my local bookstore for almost 17 years and that is a long long time if my career was a person that i would be cramming for the sats yes <laughs> sexual assignment training yeah. <laughs> i'm assuming the sats stand for mm-hmm. sexual assignment training so i guess that's just preparing you for what sexuality you want to be yeah like crossing your fingers well i think it's assignment well, yeah, i think I think you just get a card. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Here's your new set. It's part of the diploma, actually. Yeah. You know. And and as such, I really do have my fingers on the pulse of the book world, and I am here to thrust my fingers down your throat with this week's unforgettably forgettable installment of Notes from the Bookstore. Dun-dun-dun. Thank you. And it's the beginning of October, which means it is the holidays for no one but me. Yeah. It's now the time for what we in the biz call coots. Coots. Coots is a bookstore lingo. Coots stands for Christmas overstock something something I don't know. But what it means is, right now, our store is slowly but surely stocking up for the holidays. So, hey, Steve, here's 14 copies of every single Berenstain Bears book that's ever been written. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Berenstain Bear books, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. And in each one, Mama Bear is a horrible person. <laughs> I had a I had a group on Facebook for a while called Mama Bear is kind of a bitch. Yeah. The Facebook group. And it was the place I went to to post proof of how horrible a person Mama Bear is. But hey Steve. Uh you know it the movie that came out a month ago? Yeah, here's 90 copies of it. Uh-huh. Here's 90 copies of Stephen King's It. Here's 18 copies of every Bill O'Reilly book ever written. (laughs) It's like a game of real-life Tetris for no one but me, and it's nigh impossible. Thank wood I have my yoga, my because I do I do a lot of yoga. I do hot yoga. I do tepid yoga. Okay. I do hot crossed buns yoga. And of course, of course, the one thing that keeps me grounded is my debilitating angel dust addiction. Yes. Without that, without my angel dust, there's just no way that I could go on. Like, And I know I have to stop. I know that eventually, you know what I have to do? I have to attack the whack. <laughs> you have to attack the whack. Yeah, I have to whack the attack, or whack the attack, depending on which way you want to do it. Emerald, do you want to say this in... Do you do you want this to be a part of the podcast? I'm sorry, no, I'm just talking with Jaden. Okay. Yeah, sorry. No, we, it's, it's we fine. know. <laughs> Sweet one, I just really wanted you and Amber and Jaden and a screaming baby to be a major part of this week's podcast. So I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. So thank you to all of you. That's really awesome. Now, Bonnie. Yes. The main story I want to talk about this week on notes from the bookstore. Yes is a strange one because okay. this is this is our literary part of the show so this will it will seem like this isn't fitting it will sound like the story i'm about to launch into is in no way book related it will sound like i'm just bsing you and ranting about horror movies and junk it'll sound odd in this world of literary whoozy what's it's okay. but look Look, just trust me, okay? Trust I trust me. you. It is book-related 
It's just going to take us some time to get there. Okay. Okay? Okay. 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 So, let's talk about the life of Toby Hooper. Okay. Director Toby Hooper. His story. And didn't he? Didn't he? If I'm not mistaken, I think he also directed Funhouse, the movie version yes, of the book. There, that don't, you mentioned. Don't, no, 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 no! Don't get there yet. Don't okay, get there yet. Okay. <laughs> Toby Hooper's story amazes me. So in the early '70s, Toby Hooper made an 89-minute hippie film called Eggshells. Okay didn't know that he made a film before he made his film you know yeah i didn't realize that he made an experimental hippie art film before he made the one film that everybody knows him from (laughs) but yeah he made it for forty thousand dollars so basically next to nothing and also coincidentally nothing is what the movie did in what little theaters it ever played in okay Still, he made a movie. You know, he did it, and he really thought, hey, I made one film. Sure, nobody saw it, but that doesn't matter. I did it. I still did it. It's the one thing I wanted to do, and I did it. And so if I did it once, I can do it again. So one day while watching the ultra gore that they would show from Vietnam every day on the freaking news. Right. He gets an idea for a horror movie. He made it on the cheap for next to nothing with a crew of unknowns who worked long, hard hours day and night only because they couldn't afford to rent the cameras for that long. That (laughs) blows away. They're like, okay, so we've got these cameras, but we can only afford them for, for this amount of days. So, sorry, guys. We're filming 20 hours a day. Yeah. For two weeks. And also, we're, we're also going to be filming this primarily in an unair conditioned barn mm-hmm. in 125 degree heat. But I swear, guys, this is all totally going to be worth it. The effects were cheap and minimal. This is not a gory film. And the reason why it's not gory is not because, like, nowadays directors would say, oh, yes, we. We scaled back the gore because we thought that it would be an an artistic approach to merely uh, make you think of the horror we thought was a more visceral approach to the type of film that we wanted to do. No, Toby Hooper is like, oh, couldn't fucking afford it. Yeah. Yeah, just couldn't afford it. So we did what we could. (laughs) So... The locations were were the locations that they shot at could literally be counted on one hand, and they all got injured while mm-hmm. filming this cheap indie movie, basically on the fly. Yeah. But then he finishes the movie and he tries to release it, but like for a year, no one wants to touch it. Yeah. No one wants to touch it, and then finally, when it's released. The director is going, oh, man, finally my movie's going to be released. Now, I'm thinking since there's literally no gore, you don't see things happen. Bella, can you get that bag away from the baby? Okay. Thank you. So be, the, 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 the Toby Hooper is thinking, yeah, there's no gore. There's no violence. You don't see any anyone really being killed. They, you know, we kind of... We kind of you, we we hint that it's happening, but you don't ever actually see it. It's like the right. psycho shower scene. You never see a knife go in, but still, it's the scariest, the scariest scene of all time. So that's the sort of thing we're going for in this film. And because yeah. there's no gore, I'm thinking this is going to get a PG rating. <laughs> okay, is what the director thought. But uh, despite when it's when the movie's released, despite its noticeable lack of gore. Yeah. It's rated X. And it's rated X pretty much basically because of its name. And that's it. Really? Yeah. Like I've told the kids before. I've told Bella this before. She still hasn't seen the movie yet, but I've told her a numerous times before. The scariest part of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the title. Yes. If the film was called Fun in Texas, mm-hmm. 
it wouldn't be as scary. But it's called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And it got an X rating pretty much because it was called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, as a theory, I suggest that if you got Sesame Street Presents Follow That Bird, the yeah. movie, the first Sesame Street movie, and you didn't change the film at all, but you just renamed it The Virgin's Blood Orgy. <laughs> it would be rated X. Yes. Despite the fact that this is a G-rated film, it's getting an X because of the name, and that's what happened to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The film is released. People protest. Churches fight the release. Parents groups fight the release. There are pickets. Some areas of the nation ban it outright. Some countries ban it outright. Mm -hmm. It it becomes the most controversial film. Literally every single solitary place this movie plays, there's controversy. It was made for next to nothing. It makes millions of dollars. Well, controversy helps, man. Controversy never hurts a movie. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> the Guardian called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, quote, the most influential movie in history. Not the most influential horror film, the most influential movie of all, all time. So uh, such- I don't know. I, I don't know if I can agree with that. Certainly in horror. Yeah. You know? Because the yeah. premise, the premise of Texas Chainsaw Massacre has easily been ripped off as many times as Night of the Living Dead. Oh yeah, and sometimes it was ripped off by Toby Hooper. You know, I, I mean, they've got to be mm, fifty. You know, fifty inbred hillbilly killer movies. Oh hell yeah! You know, those have eyes. Yeah. yeah. So suddenly, Toby Hooper is a household name, and his cheap little film is a massive, massive worldwide hit. That is great and also sad as hell. (laughs) Because now, poor Toby Hooper spends literally the rest of his life trying to replicate his one big success and failing miserably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he literally spends the rest of his career trying to do another Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And Bella, what are you doing that the baby is just screaming? Help me out, people. Podcasting. He's, can, now you're crying, Bella. Can you not fake cry? You're just going to piss her off even more. Jeez. Thanks, Eleanor. I find the Toby Hooper story to be both a massive success story and a, a, a real American tragedy. Yes. Because with a big, huge success like that comes the fact that you'll never do this again. Yeah. You know? You got lucky and, and that's it. Yeah. He tries and tries and tries and spends the rest of his life trying to replicate this one thing that he you know that that he made a name for himself with one film and now struggled to to prove to himself that he wasn't just this film yes you know Mm -hmm. so then so his next film a few years later was eaten alive and of course people said oh this is this is toby hooper's next big thing this is the next texas chainsaw massacre yeah. But the producers are fucking with him. They're fucking with his movie, his budget. They don't trust him. They slash his budget. They don't trust his casting. And it, eventually, he walks off the set before the movie's even done. Okay. So, boom. That film's not a huge hit. Ellen, Eleanor! I'm, I swear to God, I'm going to raise you, Eleanor to be a podcaster so that when I'm like 65 years old, I'm just going to be in the background yelling during your important show. That's what I'm going to do. The drummer from Deflepard only had one arm. 
Yeah. So the next thing he did was actually a TV miniseries of Stephen King's Salem's Lot. I didn't realize it was a miniseries. Yes. Yeah. But it yeah. was a TV miniseries that was then cut and released in theaters in Europe. Yeah. So a lot of times it's seen as a movie when in fact it's not a movie at all. So it's good, sure, and he got a big budget for it, but it definitely wasn't the next big thing. So then, now it's the 80s, and Universal taps Toby Hooper to, to make a horror movie for him. And what he comes up with... Jesus, Eleanor! Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm getting mobile. Okay. Oh, fella, I just unplugged your thing. I just unplugged your thing. So the next thing that he does is a spooky, atmospheric, 80s horror film, which I love. I love this film so much. And, yeah. and, and I, I think it's so good and the fact that so few people like even know of its existence is just sad yeah it's a spooky story about a group of teens who go to a carnival there's crime and nudity and violence and sex it's called the fun house and once again sadly this just followed toby hooper wherever he went the universal is going oh this is gonna be the next big thing this is gonna be the next Texas chance on massacre yeah in fact, Universal was so convinced of the success of this film that, that Universal went, okay, this is going to be a huge film. This is going to be the next Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, guys. It's going to be huge. So we really want to go all out for this film. We've got this amazing poster. We've got these amazing uh, previews we've got lined up. The The script is really boffo. That's something that I'm assuming that all of us Hollywood types say. So this is our idea. We want to get a writer to write a novelization for this movie. Here's oh. the script. You take this novel. We want to give it to a, a writer or a horror writer, somebody, uh, and have them make a novelization of it. And then it, it'll be released at the same time as the movie. So the movie will advertise the book. The book will advertise the movie. It's win-win. So uh, let's get Stephen King. Stephen King, come over here. We want to. Oh, you're not even taking our calls. Okay, you're way too important for us. Well, crap. <laughs> okay, well if we can't get Stephen King we need the next best thing what's your name my name's Dean Koontz sir oh well Dean Koontz you seem to be a young uh, energetic writer well gee whiz I sure do hope so mm -hmm. in my mind Dean Koontz talks like a superhero sidekick yeah so this is our idea. We've got this horror movie coming out. This is the script. We want you to take it and write a book about this script. What do you think about that? Well, gee, Willikers, that would be gosh darn swell. <laughs> so Dean freaking Koontz, or as I like to call him, Diet Stephen King. Yes. Like Stephen King light with a twist of lemon. Um, Stephen King Zero. The sci-fi oh, channel Stephen. Stephen King. Yes, yes, yes. The Asylum Stephen King. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Stephen King Zero. All of Stephen King with Zero the calories and talent. Mm -hmm. Stephen King Zero. So Dean Koontz gets the script for Funhouse and turns it into a novel. But the film ended up taking way too long because, of course, Universal got Toby Hooper syndrome. Mm -hmm. They're like, this movie's going to be huge. It's going to be the next Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, wait, we're panicking. Okay. Uh, Toby, we're uh, cutting your script. We're cutting your budget. And when the, you're done... Oh, you're done with the movie? Great. We're just going to sit on this film for about a year and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Dean Kuhn is like, I'm done with the book, guys. Okay, I'm bringing the book to the publisher. Okay, it's being published. Okay, my book's out. So the so Dean Koontz's book, The Fun House, comes out a year before the movie does. Okay. But here's the kicker. Um, Dean Koontz, Dean Koontz did up. Uh-huh. So the book that he eventually writes has so little to do with the movie it's fucking ridiculous 
<laughs> Dean Koontz's book is all about Satanists who are trying to find a suitable woman to host the Antichrist. Mm. And there's rape. And this woman gives birth to a baby with demon powers. And then eventually there's an abortion and murder and crime and incest and just boo. <laughs> okay. Boo. You suck, Dean Koontz. Like, you're basically just proving my hatred for you. Like, I didn't yeah. have a reason to hate you before. I just, I love Stephen King, so I assumed you sucked. But now I have reason. Mm -hmm. That's like, I'm going to make a novel. I'm going to make a novel of Saw, but it's going to be about these witches. Yeah. Who uh, rape a midget. And somebody and, saw. Yeah. And somebody yeah. saw that. So, yeah. Yeah. Somebody saw it. Yeah. And that's why my novel's called Saw. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's the story of Toby Hooper and Funhouse. So, see, I told you the story was book related. Yes. So. Dean Koontz, man. I, I, I've, I've wound up reading way too many Dean Koontz books in my life. Mm -hmm. And I can't fucking remember any of them really, but but yeah. I, I, what I really remember is all of his books were kind of heavy on the cop, bodyguard, whatever, strong male figure of authority, and a damsel yeah. in dis in distress type. Ugh. You know yeah. that's what yeah. that's that's what I remember from every. Dean Koontz book I've ever read. Yeah. I remember reading the story of, 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 of one of those uh, beautiful, attractive white women who are kidnapped by someone and it garners media attention because it's a white woman. Yeah. Uh huh. And she spent like, she spent like 12 or 14 years in some guy's basement. Yeah. Getting like a, uh, like, raped all the time and and so she finally got out and she's way older and so of course she immediately gets a trip to oprah and a book deal out of it yeah and so she's writing her story rebecca smart amy smart somebody smart one of them was a smart no you don't have to look it up. you don't have to look it up Are you sure? yeah yeah no no it's fine it's fine her last name is smart that's smart a bitch smart bitch that was raped in on Oprah. Yeah, Google that and see what happens. <laughs> uh, raped by his mother. Raped by his <laughs> mother? No, no, no. Kidnapping of Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Thank you. Smart. There you go. That was surprising. That was a surprisingly successful Google search. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know how to Google. Yeah. No, nice. no. You're good at googling. I wouldn't have thought to just Google smart bitch. <laughs> that that bitch, yeah. yeah, but still it worked. It worked. It worked. Good job, Google. <laughs> like I remember like, Yeah. Yeah. So she wrote this book about her time being like uh kidnapped in like this guy's dungeon. And I remember when the book came out, a woman returned her copy of the book. Yeah. And of course you return a book we have to ask you why and and the woman said oh well it wasn't what i expected it was really depressing <laughs> it's like what the hell you think it was gonna be a laugh riot yeah like what is wrong with you maybe she was in now, hear me out. okay i'm hearing you out maybe I'm gonna maybe hear you she in. was just like expecting uh romance a what? A rape kink book. Okay, gotcha. Like role play, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Maybe that's what she was expecting. Because... Ooh, she was raped and she didn't like it? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you mean he wasn't playing around? Yeah. It was real rape? Yeah. No. <laughs> I better return this immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so in the book, she talks about how she she's like, like in this basement and she's barely getting any food and her life is horrible and the only thing that she has to escape she can't she doesn't listen to radio she doesn't have the internet she doesn't have a phone she doesn't have a tv all she has are these is a box 
of Dean Kuhn's books. Oh, oh no, that's cruel and inhumane. <laughs> it is like that's even that's like torture times two. Oh my god, that's like that's like I'm being held in this prison in Vietnam, and yeah. they rip out my fingernails and they shove hot pokers up my ass and every day I'm whipped for hours and my only comfort is the music of Justin Bieber (laughs) the only music I'm allowed to listen to oh man the only the only song I'm allowed to listen to is Friday by Rebecca Black Like, damn, there's torture, and then there's torture part two, Electric Boogaloo. Yeah. Like, I don't read, I, like, I don't read a lot. Like, I read in shifts. My reading is a bell curve. Sometimes I read a bunch, and sometimes I just don't. I'm a busy man. And so, like, I can't imagine, like, the only thing you were allowed to read is Dean Koontz. Like, that's sad. Yeah, but if you if you die with a Dean Koontz book in your hand... You can put on your tombstone, died of mediocrity. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. And that is it for notes from the bookstore this week. And remember, nice, honey. That was on the podcast. That was perfect timing. You timed that belt wonderfully. And remember, you too can save 10%. On all of your purchases. And all you have to do. Is record a single episode. Of the podcast. (laughs) Without mentioning Misha Collins once. (laughs) Without mentioning Misha Collins once. Misha Collins. He plays Castiel on Supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Every time he I'm goes, every time, awesome. every time Misha Collins goes to a convention, he wears the same pair of lucky underwear. Okay. Aren't they orange? No, he doesn't wear, no? okay, no, correction. Okay, correction. He does not wear the same pair of lucky underwear. He has the same I mean, it kind? it might be coincidental that he has, ends up wearing them, but all of his underwear, or 90%, 99% of his underwear are all orange. Because... He only wears orange underwear. He only wears orange underwear. You could ask Misha Collins to see his underwear, and he'll show you his orange underwear. It's to keep it's to keep hillbilly hunters from raping you. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, Eleanor has ran into this bedroom, and just so that she can wave at you, bunny. Hi. She still she still doesn't get the fact that. Skype isn't always video. <laughs> so she is waving at you. I'm just Say saying that hi. if I'm just saying that if Ned Beatty had been wearing orange underwear, he would have been safe. Yeah. Yeah. 